Hello everyone. Um, the first upload of the tour of the American Printing House for the Blind was an epic fail. I don't know what happened. I don't know why the screen was black and why there was no audio, but it saved my laptop that is way as well. So I did very quickly go in and put it all back together again, and I'm going to put that up now so that you guys can see it as quickly as possible. Also want to warn you that videos are going to come fast and heavy for the next week while I catch you all up in time to where I'm at, so expect that there's going to be like two a day. Um, so lots of content coming up, but then I'll also be putting out as quickly as I can videos about the busy season here in Quartzsite, Arizona. Um, so you have that look to look forward to, and so thank you very much for your patience while I work through some technical difficulties. and. Here, without further ado, is the tour of the American Printing House for the Blind. Hey everyone, we're about to go tour the American Printing House. American Printing House has been publishing books in Braille and for the blind and for those with low vision since the 1800s, um, early 1900s. And they have a factory tour that you can go on as well as a museum that you can visit. Some of the things that I can't show you because it was part of the, the factory tour. And they want to keep the privacy of the people who work there so they don't allow you to take any photos or video while you're in the, the factory part of the tour. It's very interesting to see what initial technologies they were using where they were just embossing, layering layers of uh, embossing material and using that where today now they can take that embossed piece and layer a very thin sheet of plastic over it and plastiform it and then you get that same ridge or outline or series of dots without having to use layers and layers and layers of embossing material you can just use the the plastic and i believe that's how this card was made you can see that it's just a really thin sheet um, but it's got you know the dots on the reverse I don't know how well that's coming across on the camera, but it's got the braille here, and you can just maybe see the dots in that shot there. And of course they can do that with thicker and thinner layers of plastic, and they can um, make tactile representations of land formations, cell structures, uh, musical notation, which has its own braille system. Um, <laughs> Uh, what else did I see? Uh, pictures of butterflies. Um, and just display the world so that in a way that people who are using their hands to see things um, or to experience things, I shouldn't say see because that's not the right word, um, but who are getting uh, representations of objects and concepts tactilely instead of visually. And it's really interesting to go through the museum and display area where you can touch and feel and manipulate some of these items. Um, they have one thing that looks like your standard play mat with little cars and stop signs and the like on it, but all of the pieces are movable and can be re-velcroed in different locations. And the idea is that you map out a person's neighborhood with here's your high rise, here's the school, there's the bank, there's the library, um, here's the railroad tracks. And then they can practice a route before actually uh, maneuvering through that route. They can go, oh, okay, I need to walk down the sidewalk until I get to this crosswalk. And then if I cross on this side, I can avoid the railroad tracks if I go across this way. And so it was really interesting to look at that map and imagine how you might learn to navigate your environment um, by understanding it conceptually through your hands first before putting your whole body into that scenario. It's an interesting way of, of thinking about learning and how people learn. Um, one of the pieces that my tour guide found really, would have found really useful had it been offered to her as a student, there's a way to teach people who learn tactilely how to represent a 3D image in a, a three-dimensional object in a two-dimensional um, graphic or tactile 
And what they do is they take what is effectively those magnet toys where you have little magnetic balls and little magnetic rods and you make a cube out of that and you can hold the cube and tell that it's, you know, a cube. But then you can smush it and without disconnecting anything, just kind of smush it. It'll look like the Tesseract picture in uh, Wrinkle in Time, you know, the fourth dimension picture. And that's a way for a person who experiences the world tactilely to understand that this graphic that they're looking at or, or touching in a book that has this touch feel to it is where they took this three-dimensional thing and smooshed it into a two-dimensional representation. And my fully sighted tour guide is like, I would have understood geometry so much better <laughs> if that had been available to me. And I understand that. Those, those graphics do take a, a different way of thinking about and conceiving of things. Um, and so it was just so fascinating to go through this museum and tour in the factory <clears throat> and see all the different ways that that people who are trying to make visual learning tools available for tactile learners. Um, they also had several magnifiers that I had never seen before to help people with low vision that will both make the thing that you're looking at larger, but will also change the contrast so if you can see to read, but say you have cataracts <laughs> and you need things to be brighter or things to be different colors or things to just be larger. Um, this one magnifier that I really want <laughs> now that I know it exists, you lay the book underneath it and it blows up whatever part it's focused on. Um, but it will then change the size, it'll change the contrast, it will uh, do all kinds of manipulations. And it would be handy not just for, um, for reading, but imagine you're in the kitchen and you need your cookbook to be large enough so that you don't have to get right down on it. You can just turn around, look at your cookbook and go, oh, that's what that's trying to say. Um, or if your cookbook is one of those fancy modern books that they didn't print it black on white, they printed it white on brown, um, you could have one of these readers readjust that, that um, contrast in this case. You could change the colors in that way. Um, this machine does that. And so that was really fascinating. Um, there's another device that looks like a USB mouse. Only this USB mouse has a camera mounted where the laser would be. And so it will blow up onto a television screen or, or a computer monitor, whatever you scan the laser under, uh, over. Um, so instead of being like a mouse telling you where you are on the, on the screen, it's a camera making larger whatever you have the camera pointed at. Uh, so that was a really neat piece. Um, just all kinds of adaptive technology that exists. Um, they do have a catalog. I will put the QR code for the catalog up on the screen. And if any of you have need of any braille books or devices or low vision devices, their catalog has all of that. I've not looked at the catalog yet, um, but when I remember the name of that reader, I will put it on the screen so that you can see all the cool things that that reader does and maybe get a better understanding of what life is like for people who are blind or who have low vision. Um, when I, there was a point in time when I worked with adults with developmental disabilities, several of these devices would have been really handy for working with a lot of those folks as well. So multiple uses, multiple opportunities. And as she stated, a lot of folks who are becoming uh, blind or having low vision these days are aging babies.
Yeah.